Like it isn't like on the fourth day Jesus blasted his abs. <laughs> on the fifth day did a killer of a body workout. On the sixth day Jesus did legs. No, he didn't. Leg day is horrible. We we're all skipping leg day, right? The bitches don't care about the legs. It's all about the guns, right? Seven day he rested. Amen. Like, of course, people in the Bible were probably asking about his workout routine. They're like, hey, Jesus, how much you lifted these days? How much am I lifted? Oh, you know, just the weight of the sins of the world. <laughs> that small weight. Yeah. You don't have to be on board with that joke. <laughs> but what I'm trying to tell you is the Lord works out in mysterious ways. <laughs> Should end it there, but it's a kind of dumb joke. We all know you have CrossFit, right? That's... Yeah, we're in there. <laughs> right, yeah, we should have stopped when we were there. All right, everybody, we've we got a great podcast for you tonight. It's going to be a lot of fun. We have the very funny Chris Spangle, Greg Lentz, and of course, from the hit show, The Apprentice, <laughs> with Donald Trump. Give it up for Rupert, everybody. We have a good day. to Jeff Fibber. Give another round of applause for Jeff Fibber. <laughs> oh, wow. I can't see any of you. This is great. Yeah, yeah I can't see Whoa, this is professional. Great. I know. It's a this. Wow. It's way too professional for us. Well, I'm Chris Mangle. This is Greg Lenz to my left, as always. Woo! Uh, Thanks, Rob. <laughs> If you need an ass kissed, Ross <laughs> Kessler's your man. He's very wonderful. And then, of course, Rupert Bodum from the hit TV show The Apprentice. Yeah, that Survivor. 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 Yeah, Survivor. Also ran for governor in 2012. Yeah. Four years ago, you and I were spending a lot of time together. A lot of time. A we, lot of time together. We had just rolled out of the RV in Las oh. Vegas around this time, uh, yep. you know, and then I spent 36 hours in an RV smelling Evan's feet. Uh, yeah, I missed the ride back. I heard it was real exciting. He loves that shit. Yeah. Does he vape? Yeah. Oh, he vapes. Okay. He vapes hard. Did he vape then? We didn't know no. what vaping was back then. We smoked. Oh, God. Yeah, I, I'm not a smoker, and it was 36 hours of... <laughs> we thought it. Like hanging out with the team inside. <laughs> Oh, I'm a courteous smoker. I know, you were. Yes, I am. Maya, not so much. Yeah, not so much. Yeah, 36 hours in an RV with Maya Axton. <laughs> Can you say hell? We're, we were somewhere near Albuquerque, and the RV that we had for the campaign, the, 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 the transmission wasn't tuned for Albuquerque in the mountains. Right. So we're going up this, and I hear Skrillex bangerang going. <laughs> it's bang rang, ba ba ba, kind of like this loud, uh, loud electronic music. And it's like four in the morning, and I am laying down behind Maya, and I'll, all oh, really? I hear is her scream. Shut up. All I hear is her going, Fuck! God damn it! Fuck! You motherfucking piece of shit! That was like, I'm like, oh we're gonna die! Oh, we're yes. gonna die! Uh, and you're in the back on the bed, and you were thinking we were gonna die. Who strikes? You know, it's amazing that we didn't see some of the, the close calls that Maya explained to me after we got there. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I could sleep through a lot of them. And you all have to understand, this is when Maya was transitioning without a doctor's help. Yeah. And was buying, <laughs> was buying hormones yeah. off the internet. Yes. That was an extreme Maya. Oh, this was angry, bitter, half Jeremiah, half Maya. <laughs> it's, what's the other? <laughs> the sweetheart housewife Maya that we have today. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Maya, Maya has said she'd be here, so. Yeah. Fuck her. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well. You look ridiculous. I do, I do. But the hat. What are you wearing? Um, I thought I would uh, try to trigger our audience because we talked. It's been a long week. Right. It's been a long week. We were both kind of exhausted, and it's only Monday. <laughs> and uh, we came up with the idea of we all completely triggered. And so I thought I'd try to piss off every audience member here and make America great again. Woo! <laughs> and we're Rob. Thanks, Rob. Let's just let Rob wallow in his There you go. He knows Donald Trump. He's, he's here with Haley, the beautiful Haley. Hi, Haley. This is so much more fun since he can't respond and you can talk about his <laughs> He's just sitting there awkwardly. Usually you say the very beautiful Haley. Right. 
You're not gonna do it now? No. Okay. No, because now it's weird. She's in the room. That's awkward. <laughs> oh, you are a libertarian. <laughs> right. There's girls here. I'm shy. Uh, you, I, we somehow ended up matching. Yeah. A ridiculous piece of clothing and a gray shirt. Did well, you, the socks. Did your girlfriend pick that out for you? <laughs> You're funny. We're getting started already. Are we going to start already? Yeah, we're already. Oh, okay. So we're trying. So listen, I've had a hard day. It's been a long day. You know the life of Chris Bangle. It's very difficult. Right, Christy? Everybody wants to be your friend. Everybody demands time. And so I'm just sitting in the green room, relaxing, trying to, uh, you know, center myself, get my chakras in line before the show. This is a very big show. In walks Greg and Yoko. Yoko, huh? <laughs> and then her friend. And they start. <laughs> like. Two chickens henpecking each other. In there. Well, that's what women do. So, like, the libertarians aren't used to it. There's like two women in a room, that and they is. like catch up and have girl talk. Right. Right. So, I was trying to acclimate you to that. It was very nerve wracking. I know. You're like, Wait a second. If I say something witty, will they like me? <laughs> and the answer was no. Well, it's the socks. Well, listen, it screams out there, right? Right, Rob? Yeah. Yeah. When well, you haven't noticed, the liberty socks are very, very fitting. Yeah. These are for my lovely girlfriend, Emily. She got me these socks. Uh, she apologizes she couldn't make it here. And thanks again to Jeff Gibbert for coming up with five minutes just out of his ass. He's the man. I mean, Thank you, Jeff Gibbert. Everybody get a round of applause again to Jeff Gibbert. Uh, Mittens also joins us. I left the Hitler picture that Greg got me last time uh, at home. A lot, of, a lot of new faces in the crowd. You can't see uh, Greg, but... Almost the entire crowd is different than last time. Love that. I know. No, I don't think that's a good thing. No, that is a good thing. Nobody came back a second time. No, no, no. They told their friends to come and see what's going on. Right. And then they didn't come with Paul <laughs> oh, That's And Crystal are here. That's called trolling. <laughs> we promised we'd do better next time, but you're all, <laughs> you're all about to make us go on. Uh, well, those socks, when you put those on, I actually heard your hymen grow back. It was pretty incredible. <laughs> I'm actually a little disappointed that neither one of you put any tie-dye on. You're right. A little tie-dye. Chris, I know you at least have a lot left over from the oh, campaign. Oh, I stole the shit out of uh, I know. Rupert for governor campaign t uh, I think he sold them on eBay for a dollar. No, I, I still wear them all the time. Oh, yeah, my yeah. God. And How many Ethiopians are running around with tie dye ready for government church right now? <laughs> Several thousand. <laughs> no, they're running around with Rupert made it, the governor shirts. You know, I had to print up a bunch of those. I thought I was going to win. You know? Yeah, there's so a, those are the ones you sent to Ethiopia. Thanks you to do that. If, if you're wearing a Rupert for Governor t-shirt, come up here. I saw a couple of Christy. I love that. Yeah, yeah. Come and take a look at the different types. So there is the machine type, uh, and then there yes. is this was tie dyed by Rupert. Yes. So lovely we, model, Christy. In our campaign, tie dye was our. Paul, make sure you do a spin around. Was our color? Show the eyes the goods. Yeah. There were a few thousand shirts tie-dyed by my wife and I. After the first thousand, we swore we were never going to do it again. <laughs> a couple months went by, and you forget you, know, you forget about the pain of doing something like that, and um, it ended up my guys in the mentoring program and I doing it. <laughs> and Laura. And That's, Laura. And Laura. Is that exploiting and cheap labor? Uh, no, that is, uh, <laughs> that is teaching young men and women how to... Run a campaign on a shoestring, like every libertarian has to. Interesting. Look how the three of them are not looking at the crowd because they're so uncomfortable. I know. <laughs> and, and, and Paul's Thank ready. you. Give them a round of applause. Paul's yeah. ready to the public office. <laughs> yeah. Your, your wife was not happy with you by the end of that campaign. She was not happy at all. No? Well, well I, I, you know, if I really would have known what I was doing, I wouldn't have started a year and a half out. I right. wouldn't have. I wouldn't have. Not thinking that I was going to campaign every day all the time. Six months into the campaign, and we had to talk with Laura about we still got a year of campaigning, and we go out every day, and yeah. we don't make any money. We spend money, and we're going to have to do it for another year. Hey, Evan, come up here. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're going to talk about the campaign, we have to have Evan. Evan, Evan McMahon is the greatest campaign. campaign manager I've ever had in my life. Yeah. He's a real he he person. Only one. <laughs> He was wonderful. I know he's here. I don't know if he's going to come up. He'd make me. He's, he's baby. He's, yeah, he's outside baby. You know, it's kind of sad you can't baby. 
it's really sad that you can't smoke in your own establishment, but that's another story. So, why did you decide to run for governor? Um, you know, I, for 20 plus years, have been running our mentoring program showing that we're spending billions of dollars locking, trying to lock our problems up. We're eliminating vocational ed out of our schools. We're spending, uh, in, that, in the campaign, I showed we were spending over $6 billion a year on our education. And the, the uh, administration was taking, I said 52%, they said no, no, no. They finally admitted to 48, what do you think they're really taking? Half, $3 billion a year to our administration of our public schools which is thousands of people, and then the other side, millions of children and teachers that share the other half of that pie. Um, so many times, time after time after time, the dollars that we're spending that are ours are being misspent. And this, Evan, the greatest campaign manager I have ever had in my life right there. Evan the man, You would have won one, sir. Yeah. And then you quit the party? We try to rebuild what we spent, but you know, giving our like like I teach my kids in my mentoring program, when you've got something to say, stand up and say it. When you know something's not right, the libertarians were the only party that were standing up for equal rights for all, standing up in the uh, against the, the DOMA and HR6, standing up against being able to show we all have value and believing that it was only us as the libertarians. We have in the same darn election right now, thank goodness Rex Bell is running, as, uh, you know, I mean, we need a solid libertarian to run against Mike and John. Well, for those out of state who may not be familiar with Indiana politics, in 2012, Rupert ran against John Gregg, the Democrat, and Mike Pence, the Republican. And those two are on the ballot again against Rex Bell. But yes. one of them loves gays this time. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, now, you know, loves the gays. Now we Isn't that weird that he now all of a sudden has flip flop to Yeah, him. exactly. Well, I mean, he's, now he's pro-union, he's pro-gay. Right. And then in 2012, uh, when, when this was all coming up, with it was the gays and the unions all in the same month. But, and here's the Democrat goes out and says, I'm proud of my history of protecting traditional marriage in Indiana. He was a Tea Party Democrat. <laughs> and we're just like, so we instantly were like, oh, hell no. <laughs> like, uh, Let's do this better. And, uh, and the LGBT community, along with the unions in 2012, at the end of the campaign, issued death threats against Which is you funny the campaign. because what, what's crazy about that is there were several really prominent people in the Indiana Stonewall Democrats, that's the queer Democrats. Um, True. Actually, he can say that. He's okay, queer. I'm queer. Um, <laughs> Only well, faggots can say that. Double <laughs> 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 trigger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was cursed that was in the end. I don't talk like that. Uh, but the, the leaders of the, the Indiana Stonewall Democrats actually came up to us at Pride to buy t shirts, to buy super campaign shirts, because when John Gregg was coming to speak to them, they wanted to wear them huh. as a you know, blatant screw you to him. And we did probably four or five different. LGBT pride things. Oh, gotcha. Fort yeah. Wayne, uh, Lafayette, Indy, Spencer. Uh, Spencer, Indiana? Yeah, yeah uh, seven years now. It's, wow. it's an amazing event. Yeah, all the churches no have to come out to support it. And yeah. It's right there on the town. That's incredible. One of the biggest gay pride rallies in the state. And men, yeah. No, it's not. It's you know, told me that. Uh, it's not enough. the biggest one in the state. <laughs> I said, <laughs> that was that I was like like a, one of them. It sounds like a. It's, it's 12. It's this is the best. Information. It's, it's the best. Okay. It's, it's the, the best. best. It's one of the best in the state. It's the most bad. People would actually. When Vice Simpson, who I have a close personal family relationship with, when she, yeah, mm -hmm. when she would uh, drive by uh, in the parades, uh, people would see John Gregg's name and they would boo. Yeah. Uh, but then when Rupert would drive by, they would cheer and he was the only politician that would get a cheer. And I don't think it was just because you were somebody who um, stood up and said, everybody in this, every Hoosier deserves to be treated equally by their state uh, with respect and dignity. It wasn't just because you stood up and said it, it was because every single person who meets you, who gets to talk to you, 
knows that it's not a yes. Yeah. I hated you. <laughs> when Chris first told me that oh. you were, the, you were the, the potential candidate, I was so angry I broke a coffee mug. There, it is. It, you know, and unfortunately, it's still, it's, it's a little bit of that struggle where people just see that reality star, they right. see someone that they think they know, uh, but being able to show it, that's what I tried to say in the campaign. Look at our past, look at all three of our past, and who has really given back to the community and helped work on some of the biggest problems, the causes, and some of the biggest expenditures that we have in our community, and who's just taken from it. Um, being able to show that the libertarians, all of us, stood up together for every one of us, I'm very proud of that. I like knowing that we were there. See, what a lot of people don't understand about the, your campaign was that it was not a campaign run for libertarians. Right. And so we took a lot of crap from libertarians. Oh, yes. Because what? Yeah. Well, I know. you know, the first time that I start, I talk about mass transit. Oh, Jesus Christ. Libertarians were going to You bring that up again as you're off the podcast. I am still work. getting hate mail. Well, you know, we got to be able to get people to work, too. We just got to figure out how to pay for it, yeah. not be taking our dollars. It's like 2012 all over again. I, yeah, I'm going to say right now, I do not support or endorse the idea. idea. You give me shit about the wall, and you're going to let mass transit go? <laughs> no, I didn't, and I still don't. That's something where we... There are so disagree. many things that I did talk about that would make even my own campaign crazy. But that's... You look at the Republicans, and I'm, you know, I don't know if you... I don't know why you're going to touch your name. You look at the Together in a, in a room, you're not going to get all talented to agree. You're not. So you're not going to be great again, but we're going to stand together and we're going to be able to be what's going to spend our dollars. We're not going to create the entitlement programs that just throw our money away. We're not going to fill our prisons with a bunch of little potheads. 42% of our prisons full of hot smokers. I'm sorry, that's crazy. We're not going to turn people that are nonviolent offenders into violent offenders because we take that ability away from them to go to work. We're putting people back to work. We're taking care of ourselves. We're bringing things back. You're going to see me standing up a lot more, being a lot more active in the coming months. And so, what we found. What we found is that the bottom 25% of the socioeconomic ladder would come up and go, Rupert, thank you for bringing up issues that no one else is talking about. And what we found from libertarians was. Shut him up, he's in the Yeah. <laughs> so we gotta lock everybody up that break. No, we don't. We don't. We gotta the people that are hurting themselves, we don't turn them into career criminals. We give them that ability to take care of themselves. We stop the entitlement programs, create empowerment programs that have an end that make you do something, get off your couch, out of your house, even if you need help will help you, you're going to do something to take care of yourself. We have to empower ourselves. You know, there was a, a story that I like to tell about the campaign. Um, when people say libertarians aren't serious, uh, we don't take politics serious, we don't actually have a plan to do anything. And I bring up the Affordable Care Act. Right. And when we met with uh, Governor uh, Daniels' staff, was over that um, there was a thing, basically, uh, the end of November of 2012, the state had to declare what kind of exchange they were going to have, whether it was a state exchange, a hybrid exchange, or just an all-federal exchange. And each one of them comes with their own pros and cons and how they affect people in Indiana. And um, Mitch Daniels, who is always really fair to libertarians, appointed libertarians to commissions and stuff, uh, said, you know, I have to get input from all three candidates so that I can make a decision based off of what they say because he's ultimately going to be the one that has to decide, but right. it's immediately going to affect the next governor. Um, so they invited us to come and, and meet, but prior to that, we spent like a week solid doing a ton of research on, on the law and what, what it was going to mean. And when we went in there, Mike Pence went first uh, the day before. Right. Uh, had like a an hour long meeting about poor people dying. Yeah, had an hour long. <laughs> and how it was celebrated. How increase, increase yeah. the surplus population. That's how you raise the median income, really. 
And, and his, his plan was, was just the, the RNC talking points over and over again about a, um, you know, a health exchange, a compact with the states and stuff. Didn't even consider anything. Um, we went in and we met with them until they lit. I mean, we were there for hours. Right. And we knew more than they did. Exactly right. And when we left that, we came up with, you know, I think it was like a five page like, white paper on what we wanted to do. And it was a hybrid exchange. Yes. Um, because it was going to give the most options to Hoosiers um, while, while maintaining some control. And, it, and that actually prevented the unfunded uh, right. mandate going right. for Medicaid, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. So John Gregg obviously came out and he said that it should be an all state exchange. Except so gauge. They, <laughs> <have it. laughs> they can't get it. No, you, for whatever gay people do with insurance, I can't go up with anything. But it was the uh, State House file. I mean, it was the law? Uh, yeah, from the Franklin uh, yeah. Franklin College journalism program. Yeah, uh, they came out and said that uh, the libertarian was the adult in the room. We were the only ones who came up with a reasonable policy, and they expected us to say the same thing that Pence said. But it's and we wanted to. We honest to God, we wanted to. But after looking at everything, it wouldn't work. We couldn't do it. No. Yeah. Uh, you know, I have to say. When people, there are so many, and we found them out on the campaign trail, like you say, we weren't running our campaign to the Libertarians, per se, we were running our campaign to Hoosiers that were Libertarian and didn't know it. Yeah. You know, a lot of Libertarian values make very, very good sense. We don't want to throw our money away. You know, we don't want to, we don't want to watch people die in the street, but, you know, I do believe also in free choice. If you want to hurt yourself, I'm not going to throw you in jail and, and call you a criminal for doing it. I'm going to try and help you, but you know it's it's ultimately your choice for yourself. We cannot, as a society, protect everyone from everything all the time. You can't. Greg. Well, I mean, I guess it's it's tough because you do get pigeonholed as a libertarian because most libertarian solutions are the opposite. It's to get rid of this and rely on this absence that it, you know this structure that doesn't exist right now. And so it's tough for you, appealing to Hoosiers, to go out and say, well, instead of um, sending the criminals to jail, we're going to rehabilitate them because you're going to get hit by the right by saying that you're pro crime. First, I don't think somebody hurt themselves is criminal, but you know, no, I agree. Smoking a plant, I don't think, is a criminal. Uh, uh, what are some of the silly things that we put people in jail for for extended periods of time while you've got others beating up others, taking from others, they get a slap on the wrist and they boot out the door? It's crazy. Anyway, sorry for interrupting. No, you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, you're kind of in political no man's land, which was why you were a compelling candidate, because you were Hoosier first, Libertarian second. And so your, your solution, the hybrid exchange, is something where you say, listen, this is an incremental approach. We're accepting the reality something has to be done. But that's not something that plays to the libertarian core. That's in fact something that outrages them You've, most of the time. But well, well, yeah. we've got hate mail. We hate mail. Well, well personally we delivered by hand. <laughs> Here, you <laughs> son of a bitch, read this. Uh, was it to you? Or? It was to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I do. They loved him. They would never even, oh, hey, Rupert. Well, give him a hug whenever they'd see me, you son of a bitch. That's because, <laughs> that's because Rupert needed somebody to be the bad guy. He wasn't going to be the uh, bad guy. I mean, you were a bad guy, and He's, I love you for it. But I, I, I was a bad guy. You have you chaired a lot of our proposals. They really, you are a great campaign manager. Did you just blame me for those? I I grew up ranking. He vapes. It's all his fault. Did I tell you he's gay? Yeah, <laughs> a lot of the things that they wrote, I still refer back to. I yeah. really call <laughs> what we have. You know, well, so, when, 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 the, when, when this all started, you know, and I, and I was saying earlier that I, I was really angry when they told me that you were a potential candidate. Right, there was still so just got to meet him. And I thought, I was like, I'm going to be really, really mean. I was like, that is that, you know, homeless looking buffoon from that show. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, you wouldn't believe how hard he tried to get me out of the damn tank top tie dye. <laughs> In the shape. Oh, I um, did. I was so impressive in the I was down here and the guys were like here on the beard. Even Robin, they were like, he was like, listening to the podcast. Yes, that yeah. was a big difference in the yes, yeah, we, 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 we trimmed up a lot. Even Rob Kendall, uh, when I saw him a couple weeks ago when he interviewed me, 
you know, you just should have shaved the beard and got rid of the whole branding that was a multi-million dollar brand that <laughs> he was on TV in front of 30 million people. You better get rid of that so he looks more political. Well, so he looks like a Republican. But that'll win. That'll yes. get him. What I was saying was, um, you know, I had this image of you going right. in. And it, right. didn't, it didn't take but going to one event with you and seeing that everything that I thought about you was completely wrong. First and foremost, you know, I've been in politics a long time and I know when somebody's BSing the, the constituent in front of them. They're, they're waiting for their moment to talk. I do it all the time. Thanks, um, <laughs> Yeah. But when I saw you interacting with people, you weren't waiting for your chance to say your talking point. You were actually listening to the person in front of you, and you actually gave a shit about what they said. But more than that, you gave an intelligent response that that person could understand. And it didn't matter if it was somebody who had a you know fourth grade reading level or if it was a geologist wanting to argue with you about public school funding. <laughs> you could stand your ground with every single person. When you went on um, the late Amos Brown's show yeah. and he was oh, questioning you about the Constitution and right. you pulled it out of your pocket and he accused you of that being a prop and you started quoting <laughs> the Constitution. <laughs> Without looking, I mean, it was just, yeah. you know, yeah. I, I don't think people give you enough very high for, being, yeah. for, for being as, we went, as amazing and intelligent as you are. We went to the state fair and talked to you. thousands of people, and I don't think there was anybody that walked away and didn't feel a personal connection. And I, I think for, for uh, I'll speak for Evan, Rupert, what he lacked in ideological purity, <laughs> he, he was that blend of... Uh, applying ideological purity to the situation in, that we're in, you know, the politics of today, as well as connecting with the voter where they're at. Um, you know, the way that you're going to bring more libertarians is, is relating that to the people that don't know they're libertarian yet, bringing them in and showing them. Giving them those libertarian answers of how we do save those dollars, how we do take care of our problems, working on the cause, not the damn symptoms, bringing them in and explaining that. Um, being able to take that, what I've learned over the last 25 years, and before that 10 years of working for the government in the institutions and watching how they care more about the documentation than actually what was going on until now where we're finally getting to a point where people are willing to pull back that curtain and see what's going on. We need accountability and we need some responsibility. So we'll get I think our, our politicians are servants to us, not our employees. So I mean, not our, our, our rulers, but our employees. So let's get into the charity work. Let's say thank you to Evan McMahon for being here. Thank you. 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 Thank uh, Rupert, you, tell us a little bit about Rupert's Kids. Rupert Kids, Rupert'sKids.org. You can follow all of your shenanigans yes. on Facebook at Rupert Bonham, uh, Rupert'sKids.org. What is Rupert's Kids? And twenty plus years being able to show how, like I said, when I worked ten years in the institutions and I watched us go in the eighties from worrying about quality of life and worrying about client care to worrying about documentation. Um, in the 90s, in 90, when I left Abilene State School and came to Indianapolis and started living with my adoptive grandparents, um, realizing that the three strikes in your out and the zero tolerance was being brought into our schools. Um, I had a young man that had been booted out of school, uh, 14 years old. If a parent did that and wouldn't let his kid go to school, they would be found neglectful. But our public school system was able to do that to our children. All through the 90s, we were doing that. Um, in 91, I incorporated Kids Hope, Kids Helping Other People Exist, and said, we're gonna stand up and show. If we eliminate the vocational ed at the same time we're throwing kids out of our school, the ones that aren't making, them in, making it in education should be guided down that vocational hallway, not guided out the door. We started throwing kids away. I started. I started down my time at Crackers Comedy. Oh, I'm sorry, my friend. Uh oh. Boo. Uh, and then other <laughs> people started to come up, and the Alley Cat, where I was bouncing, and you were bouncing at the Alley Cat. Bouncing at the Alley Cat. The alley cat. In, in the heyday. In, in the, the night, in the early nineties, when Alfred Broderick was boarded up, and people were afraid of Broderick. 
Harry and Cocaine Rod Ripple. Oh, as my. opposed to Molly and Cocaine Rod Ripple. <laughs> <laughs> Being Jersey Shore, Robert yeah. I, I talked about being able to start that program that's going to show. We got to keep the vocational ed. We got to keep kids in school. If they're not going to stay in school, we have to give them vocational education. By the 2000s, we brought, as a society, the No Child Left Behind. They made it able for us to take a child, and instead of throwing them out of school, we walk them into the detention center. Instead of walking them into the principal's office, we walk them into lockdown and we introduce them in how to be a career criminal. With 20 guys on this side telling them how to make that illegal living and no one giving a darn on them on that side. We stand up. That's what we do, honestly. We, we give that third striker, that last stopper, that ability to make a legal living by working them and paying them a minimum wage. You can see all about it on Rupert's Kids. Uh, one kind of ex exploratory question that we're going to do, Mr. Lenz. The career journalist. Uh, Scumbag Republican. <laughs> can, can you walk us through? The, so bad. <laughs> Thanks, man. Oh yeah, you're okay. Can you walk us through the average path of one of your participants? Because you know, you told me stories about twelve-year-olds with twelve thousand dollars and a light bill. Uh, you know, yeah, Joey is a good one. Dave. You're a great example. When he was eighteen, and I've been dealing with him off and on throughout his childhood life, but before I even got my hands on him. His mother had quit him on the utilities and ran him through the gas, water, and electric and ran up the bill for months in his name, took his name, you know, when they got shut off, the next kid got, was up. By the time they were 18 and trying to get their own bills, they had insane debt following them. It was outrageous. And the power companies have a monopoly. If you don't pay it, you're not going to get utilities. Uh, some of my kids have been put into foster care, put into the, the, the detention centers because no one would take them when their parents are going to jail because they had drugs on them, because they were doing something at the same time taking care. I mean, not that I condone having drugs in the house, but... If you're taking care of your children, you're paying your bills, and you're doing okay, you're going to work, and you're keeping it away from your kids. Um, like I say, hurting yourself is not a criminal, it's a cry for help. <laughs> taking your children away from you because you smoke pot is disgusting. And so, so these kids go out and they have to go into the family business at 15, uh, 14. Exactly right. Right. There, there's kids in the, in the program that at 8 years old, 10 years old, were shoved through a window that, or a doggy door and taught to unlock the doors from the inside to let their parents put their older siblings in so they could rob their neighbors. Are you saying locksmith is in the trade? Uh, locksmith is in the trade. And, and so um, they get popped for low-level drug offenses, go into the system, then they learn to become better criminals, and then what happens when they get released? When you're released and you have no education, you have no real sense of self-worth, you've never worked a legal day in your life, you don't have a good address, or, uh, and you got the scarlet letter of the detention center on your head, um, you're not getting a job. Uh, you're not getting an apartment. You're not getting a lot of things that no, uh, those of us that don't have those felonies, those charges behind us, take for granted. Um, they, the, you know, one thing that I have a lot of bad to say for our current administration, but Which one, one thing they are talking about is stopping the housing discrimination. In our state constitution, it says punishment should match the crime. A lifetime of punishment does not match a crime of smoking pot, um, yeah. um, drunk, uh, <laughs> how, how much pot have you smoked? <laughs> <laughs> See there, he's only had This is libertarian, you can share, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, well, you're all good. God bless you. Yeah. We're great Americans. You American. can't take care of yourself when you can't get legal pay, you're going to go to the illegal. When you can only live on Skid Row where it's a $100 bill to move in, and every Friday you better have another hundred dollar, or Guido here is going to come kick your door in and throw your shit out in the street. But Rupert, don't they have to take personal responsibility? I mean, they, at a certain point you make the choice to commit a crime, right? When you are taught the family trade, when you see in your neighborhood the only one that has money in their pocket is the drug dealer, the pimps, the smash and grabbers, the fences. 
the foragers, those are the ones that have money in a lot of our neighborhoods, a lot of our poor neighborhoods, in every one of our neighborhoods that I work in. You see four or five grown men standing out on the porch in the middle of the day doing nothing but drinking out of a brown paper bag, and you know the kids are inside there. Um, I walk through a gauntlet sometimes, dragging kids out of houses um, and getting them away, showing them where that you really are that strong one. You're the one that can stand up against the family and friends and say, I don't need that, I can take care of myself. But then you're battling everything you've been taught all your life, how to use the system and take, how to use the people around you and take, how to use the people that are trying to help you and take. How, why do we not see them as human beings? Um, it's <laughs> easy to see someone that might look even like me a little bit, that is a little different, um, and it's a little dirtier, a little different. You and smell wonderful. Your eyes. He does have a very good natural odor. Yeah. Uh, Musty. Uh, being able, Masculine. Yeah. <laughs> being able to turn a blind eye. Um, when you see the guys, and I just talked to a young lady standing on the side of the road with her side saying, help, I'm homeless. She couldn't have been more than 20 years old. Um, a fit young lady that I looked at, gave her one of the rivers kids cards and said, there's a hundred places that are higher than um, it's easy to drive by and not even see those people. It's easy to be that one that says, oh, um, they don't need any help. Uh, they're taking from society. There's very few of us that are willing to show them how you don't have to take. Which is what's so compelling about your message, because I actually, during my Scottish Republican days in 2012, I was working at the Romney Victory Center in Hendricks County. Uh, yeah. My girlfriend calls me Victory Wait, when did you get a girlfriend? Oh. Oh. Tell us about your charity work! No. I can't wait to deport Rob. <laughs> he like, has to go back! So you were, you were a Republican. Yeah, so, but I couldn't get over the number of people that I would talk to that absolutely loved Rupert. And the reason why the most uh, consistent uh, message I heard over and over was your talk about the importance of the vocational training right. as opposed to everybody pursuing everybody. It, it, the closest thing to a national religion in the U.S. is higher education. Right. So, I mean, for you to champion that and Pence to steal it and incorporate it in had to be a big sense of vindication for you. Uh, like Evan and I were talking about, there were a lot of things that we put out that both parties took and claimed as theirs, honestly. I took that as a badge of honor. I took that as good, at least they're listening. You know, for a minute, I believed I could be our governor. After reality finally set in, I was happy that some of the things I said actually stuck. We had reality set in, like 7.30 that night on election night. <laughs> uh, all the way up until election day, I still had the idea I was going to be, can't be our governor. Lake County, I have a strong contingency in Lake County. Have you ever seen a grown man's hopes and dreams crushed before your very eyes? Because I have. <laughs> we're sitting. We're sitting in the. Sad. We were sitting in the RV on election night. <sighs> Fuck you, Spangle. You said I'd get ten percent. Fuck you. <laughs> I, I don't think we're gonna win. <laughs> there was one minute, really, really early in the day, that we had some false report that I had pulled twenty-two percent in one district. I'm like, oh my god. And as a libertarian, that that one minute, that means a lot. Oh, it meant the world! And then <laughs> revitalized me of a wee bitch, I'll be sweating again! <laughs> oh boy, he's getting uh, what, so excited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, what was the reason that spear, you spearheaded that? Because that's something that isn't talked about. Uh, Bill Clinton talked a lot about that during the recession, that like the US economy, so there's two kinds of unemployment. There's structural and structural and cyclical. Cyclicals when you're in a recession, structurals where there's a mismatch in skills. No one was talking about structural until Bill Clinton started it, and so I didn't know if that had something that impacted you or is just something you witnessed. Well, when, witness, when we work in the system and you see what's going on every day, day to day, you see more and more jobs leaving, you see more and more programs being passed that are taking the ability for us to earn a legal living, to work our own jobs, to run our own businesses, to take care of our, ourselves. Uh, one of the things, you know, we were talking a little bit about the, the guy out there smoking pot. One of the things that I was talking about and the uh, Indiana Farmers Association really started grabbing a hold of 
was the growing of hemp. Yeah. We still have ditch weed out there growing wild. Indiana was one of the largest producers. Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, Mich uh, Michigan, uh, growing hemp. We spent $200 billion a year. That was four years ago. Who knows what we spent now? Bringing hemp products into the country. Um, how, what farmer would want three harvests a year on hemp? Why are we burning corn at $5 an acre that produces more um, crap for the environment than, it, than, than it's worth when hemp produces 100 gallons per acre per harvest? Why, gallons an acre. why don't we? What, what um, is stopping? Because we have a governor that still sees the, uh, necess the necessity to create a prohibition still on booze, let alone hemp, a product that just, I mean, if these silly kids, We've got police that will jokingly put people in jail for hemp, knowing that it's a bogus charge. <laughs> jokingly, I don't know. Aha, got you. You're not in camera. When you have an establishment and a, a governor that right. looks you in the eye and says, if you want to break the law, I want you to drive around Indiana. I about came out of my seat in the debates when he said that and went over and smacked him. You think had you, you, had you done that, that you would have won the election, that. Rupert. Why didn't you do it? Oh my gosh, I would have. You would have. You didn't let him hit pass? No. You know, we've got to start giving grants. He's for mass transit at the NAP, right? <laughs> right. Oh my gosh. <laughs> we, we passed that line a long time ago. <laughs> uh, so, Rupert, how does, how does your charity... I mean, this is one of the topics that I think people... I was having a discussion with the staff earlier. I was converting them before the podcast. Um, Hi, I'm a libertarian. Would you like to talk? <laughs> the scariest words in the English language. Have you read Bastion? One of the questions was, how, how will we fare in a welfare state? How will we take care of those who are less fortunate in a libertarian society? Um, you know, I've shown for 25 years how you take uh, a person that has just been trained to hold their hand out and teach them how, empower them, show them that they have that energy, that ability to take care of themselves. We've had um, quadriplegics that normally had the head pointer in working in our office on uh, uh, when we were in Nora, showing that there is no one out there that can't go to work. Um, taking young men and women that have never been shown how to make a legal living and raising them, by the time they're 20 or 30 years old, do you really think they're ever going to get it? No, they're going to be for the rest of their lives holding their hand out. We're creating a giant problem. If we start looking at spending our dollars a little more responsibly, not putting half of our budget into just the oversight of the program, but cutting the oversight out, having a few supervisors watching a program work that would empower instead of beat down and punish. Um, educate and train instead of belittle and degrade. Um, create a system that doesn't class people as expendable. We do deem the bottom 20% of our society as expendable. It always has been that way. It's disgusting. Those are the ones that need us the most. They're the ones that cost the most money, and they're the ones that could actually help us the most too, because they're an, an uh, uh, underutilized resource. I work with, in the last two and a half years, I've gotten zero assistance out of the Shelby County and Mary County is creating our new retire, uh, retirement uh, <laughs> empowerment program, <laughs> our reentry program. We've had 19 young men and women through the program. Every one of them were on the path to being a career criminal. That would have cost us forty or fifty thousand dollars a year in a small community, seventy to eighty thousand dollars a year in a larger community, Mary County, that deals with more mental health issues to lock them up per year, and the only thing that gives us is the ability to spend it again next year. I spend five to 10,000 a year per person empowering you, teaching you how to take care of yourself. I have mentally challenged young men that have been thrown out of the uh, system that are working side by side with others, 
that you'd never guess in a million years they scored a 55 on the IQ test. So I mean, you can get 20 for writing your name. <laughs> Blue chips. Yeah. <laughs> Neon the bell. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This test is culturally biased. <laughs> I can take almost anyone that has that want. You have to have that want. Right. You're always going to have, take 20% of the population that wants to sit on their butt and take. Uh, you know, uh, That's you almost a Mitt Romney moment, so I wouldn't you're not repeat gonna, that you're if you're not going to with them. You're going you're gonna to stop that ability for people to just take and create empowerment programs. If people don't want to help themselves, then they better figure out what to do. Without a safety net, people end up, it, it forces them to start... It's amazing when you raise the bar on a young man that's never had a bar in his life, that's never been uh, expected to do anything. Wherever you set that bar, they're going to strive to hit it, right. and most of the time they do. Even if they don't get all the way to the bar, they've done something. They're taking care of themselves. They're improving their lives. Quality of life. There are so many programs out there that show when your life is better and you have the basic building blocks of life and you're not struggling day to day, you don't cloud your mind with the booze and the drugs. You don't cloud your mind with the destruction. You empower yourself and your children. It, yeah, and I think that's an important thing that I've learned in th through all my adventures in therapy is that if somebody who has self-worth, somebody who has self-esteem, who is achieving and setting, setting and achieving goals, then there's less self-abuse. Right. And so if... And the thing that I have found remarkable in your program is that I always have the mindset of the law or mindset of you really do the crime, that you right. pay the time or whatever. It is. Right. Whatever fairy tale bull crap that is. And as I've been around your program, I've started to see these guys are the American male is emotionally stunted stunted, thank you. And you know, in in the program, the lower economic ladders. Right. It's even worse, and so right. they they haven't been shown how to express themselves or build self worth in any kind of meaningful way, and that's what you and Georgette, your your social that's worker and your mom, right. do, and you change lives through by giving them that sense of pride, by teaching them how to work, and even teaching them how to do things that they didn't know how to do, like use a fresh idea card or balance a checkbook. Exactly right. Because yeah. nobody ever showed show them how. To be able to take care of themselves. Yeah. The tough part about all this is so, it, I, I, I think like what you do is the most incredible work ever because it's the only shot of libertarianism ever spreading as an ideology and having solutions as opposed to like the state. The reason why is for so many people, including myself, I pay taxes, I don't need to worry about that, someone's hands uh, It's right. the outsourcing of government, right. or of guilt. And so when you're doing that, it's a cultural thing too. It's a mindset, you're, when you're stemming the tide on a granular level, you're changing one person and breaking that vicious cycle of poverty by being the positive male, um, I guess it's role model in their life, that is like, hey, kid, this is how you do it. You know, you hit it exactly on the head. There are so many, and it's, it's not black or white, it's not color as much anymore, it's socioeconomic. And our government is creating that separation as much as anyone. You look at how our budget is spent, where the administration taking half with thousands of people as opposed to the other side that are tens of millions. But when you have a young man or woman growing up with only one parent in the house and that parent has to go to work to try and take care of themselves, or that parent says they have so many children and they're getting a check from each child that they can't go to work, so the kid never sees anyone making a legal living, and then all of a sudden they start having trouble in school because nobody's caring about that. Because in the first five years of life, their nutrition value was nil at best. A happy meal is not the best for a two-year-old, but I'm sorry. Says you, look at me, I was <laughs> great. <laughs> you know, in the first five years, if you can't build that mind, just like I say, the mind isn't fully developed until you're in your 20s. Right. Why are we deeming an 18-year-old a legal adult and slamming them for something for the rest of their life? That first five years is so important in just building the synapses in the brain, building that ability to take care of yourself, building that work ethic, building those social skills. When you have no one to model that against, and you've never been shown anything but pain and sorrow, you've never been told anything but you're a worthless, half-hearted piece of 
Kaka, libertarian. You start believing it by your parents, by the system, by everyone around you. And then you do something stupid. You break into the neighbor's house. You do something dumb. You walk down the street smoking a joint. You're drinking a beer. Some of my kids have just been harassed for smoking a cigarette at 12, 14 years old. And on their third or fourth cigarette uh, charge, we're taking down tax right overnight. Greg and I grew up, uh, we went to Plainfield High School. We were horribly bullied. Apparently. <laughs> I had no idea I was bullied. <laughs> Turns out. So the worst, we were horribly bullied. Uh, oh, it's terrible. Uh, but I just thought that was dominatrix at high school. Right. One strike battle, you say, you know, at the. You think it's love. At, at, the small hamlet of Plainfield, the worst thing that uh, our fellow white kids could do would have was have premarital sex or smoke a joint. Heaven forbid. But when you're when you're in you that kind of system, system too. yeah, when you're in that sort of system and you see rape and murder and theft yes. and the destruction of property, a joint is the least of your worries. Um, you know, every one of my kids have met and are able to tell you two, three, four, five people that they know that have been shot in the last few years that have, um, or uh, can show you the bullet holes on themselves. You know, when Gary would come in and show you the bullet holes that when he was doing good and in a group of kids in the park and one driving by just shot into the group. That's the life they live. So let's take, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I mean, this is, this is something that's pretty important to me and something I looked at a lot. And like, so we kind of, you, you touch, the danger of going down this route is that you touch on cultural conservatism and trying to bring back traditional societal roles in a world that is trying to break those down. Right. And there's a lot of research, I mean, going back to Daniel Patrick Moynihan in the 60s and the Moynihan report saying the best thing you can do for any child to give them a good life is a strict, loving upbringing, but holding them accountable and proving to be a good example. And you would have thought he said the N-word in uh, I'm sorry, but you know, when I brought my daughter to work with me at two and a half years old and had her on my side swinging a hammer and working, at four years old got her own little Makita 9.2, couldn't really drive a screw, but could take a screw. She could take this desk apart for you in five minutes at four years old. Um, she's now 17, and we're talking about where she's going to work. She's, we're thinking about Michael's because, but she's got that work ethic. It's not even a question. Right. And when you teach someone that work is okay, when you show them, when you have that positive role model in the house going to work every day, that is the best thing that happened to me. I watched my mom and dad both together in the house going to work every day. And there's the danger though, because you're a libertarian. And so you believe in self-ownership and not telling other people how to live. And so when you touch on that rail, that, that rail of, well, we need the nuclear family and that's where they get the good example and that's what we can do to end the entitlement welfare state and bring back traditional Judeo-American values and create a great yes, society. Yes, the new nuclear family can be one adult and as many children as they can physically take care of and give a loving household to, I don't care how many adults, in a positive relationship, in a lifestyle that they choose that does not hurt others, does not hurt children, does not involve anybody. The government shouldn't be in our bedrooms, shouldn't be in our bathrooms, shouldn't be in our pockets. True. But, yeah. The, the one problem, though, that we run into is we've already created an urban class through dependency. By the creation of a welfare state. We've got a million problems out there. I want to start knocking them out. Like I show my wife in your house, in everybody's house out there, you've got a, 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 a list, a honey-do list, a problem list. You start procrastinating, you start half-ass fixing them, you start throwing bullshit money at them that you know isn't going to fix them, and that problem never leaves your list. It gets bigger. You take care of the problem, you take care of the cause of the problem, it goes away, you move to the next one. We can do that in our system, too. I said, just like people have told me forever, you can't change the world, you can't change the system. I started in 91 with that first young man named Jake. I remember him always. We've got hundreds and hundreds of families. When you consider all the children that those children have had and the children that we are empowering, I've changed thousands of lives and I just got started. Every one of us should do the same thing. We can, and we can teach our government how to do it too, if we stand together. How do we sell it conveniently though? 
we show that the libertarian does have that ability to see what the problem is. We don't want to just throw our government away. We want to make them accountable. Our founding fathers never in a million years believed that a politician would be a career. It's not a career. It's a right. It's barely it's a job. Honor. It's a privilege to be a servant to your community and go out there. All right. Uh, all you're, right. You're all right. You're all right. <laughs> Just, just a friendly reminder to try and keep table talk debates now. I would do yes. Just a friendly reminder to try and keep table talk down to a minimum because we can hear every word you're saying and it does distract us during the show. Here. <clears throat> you may be wondering why Christy Avery, the fan of We're Libertarians, Christy's our fan. Love that. Yep. Christy, it, you're going to the national convention, right? I certainly am. All right. Well, I have fifteen hundred printed pieces for you to pass out. <laughs> And so I just want to love them. They're gonna love you. Yep. So I just wanted to thank you and, and just say, hey, if you're gonna be at the convention, make sure you say hi to Christy and give her some help if you see her. Or, this is this is on Facebook Live, so yeah. share it on share it on Facebook. And as a thank you, first we want to thank Jason Doolittle because Jason donated some money to help get the printing done. He also donated a very nice piece of equipment on our Amazon wish list. Just gonna make the podcast sound much better. So, as a thank you, the trip to Orlando is is a long, long ride, right? I'm flying. You're flying. Okay, well, you got a couple of hours, so I wanted to gift you with an autographed copy of my favorite piece of fiction. <laughs> it is Spanking City Hall. <laughs> See, it, it's autographed by Greg and I. <laughs> And it's a great work of fiction, autographed by me, and Profiles and Cowardice, autographed by Brandon. So thank you very much. So thank, thank, thank you, Christy. Thank you, Christy. I'm a big fan of Rupert Steele. I'm a big fan of yours. So you're down in Shelbyville. You've moved your program down there, and you're Woo! doing you're doing <laughs> Matt. Matt's a Shelbyville person. Yep. Uh, now you are down there, and you are uh, doing economic redevelopment in a way that costs the taxpayer very little. Correct? Uh, you know exactly. It's there are no tax dollars spent at all. We being able to show that these 19 families. One of the things that we're trying to do is move all to show the Donut County. Marion County is almost a lost cause. They've got so much money that they are probably going to build another prison for 1.8, maybe $2 billion. Not talking about the hundreds of millions of dollars they're going to spend it year after year after year running it. Uh, the Donut County stands for that. They, for a few years, asked us to come there and it really enticed me to go out to Shelby County. Uh, but for the last few years, we've been showing how we take young men and women that are costing dollars every day to the community. Not only with their housing, but with the crimes that they commit, with the things that they do. Um, and we're taking the properties like every community has, board up, abandoned, burn up properties that are just encouraging the illegal in our communities. I've told many law enforcement back in my day when I was a teenager and struggling for a place to live, I would have kicked the door in and started living there myself. What's to stop people when you have nothing? Um, it's amazing what happens when that starts though. It brings another bad element into the environment, into the community. Your house next door then, who knows what's going on, maybe now, Back in my day, I would use it to go to sleep. Now, God, they're cooking meth in the dark thing. They burn the house down next door to you. You think you don't have problems? Hopefully yours doesn't go. There's, we're spending dollars. Every community out there, every community across the country has abandoned properties that cost, every property costs the community every month. <clears throat> Cleaning up the properties, keeping the grass cut, trying to keep them boarded up, trying to do something with them. The hidden costs. The hidden costs. Every community has an overcrowded detention center that in the campaign we had that letter from Pendleton guaranteeing a private sector entity that we would stay at a 95% capacity. 
The only way that you can guarantee the future like that is if you know you're not going to change the system and you're going to stay at 120 percent capacity. Yeah, as we as we all, if you walk and you watch the house I live in, it kind of talks about all of this and it shows the for-profit prison system. The criminal right. justice system has become a for-profit industry. Well, services should never be a commodity. Yeah, in the name of privatization, we have turned people's lives into a product that shareholders must be, you know, shareholders need their value. And so it's really just like a stock, op stock options program well, for elected officials. Right. Right. That dollar spent in the detention center are our dollars. That's our tax dollars. So, so you take the, the kids in your program, you get the abandoned homes or abandoned commercial right. we businesses. We buy these properties from the city for what the paperwork costs between 250, 500, you know, in Marion County, I was caught up in the land bank where we had to spend thousands and thousands of dollars for properties that went into Reggie's pocket and whoever, who knows pocket. And we got out of that another reason why we're out of Marion County. To be clear, you did not pay off uh, the oh, land bank guy. When I, when I came <laughs> back in town and my team looked at me and said, should we be worried? The land bank just got raided. I stood up. I worked with the land bank for eight years. I was one of them that... When we were fixing up properties, even before the land bank, I had worked with the auditor's office for 12 years, fixing up properties, putting them back into the community, using young men and women, teaching them how to make a legal living, paying them minimum wage, fixing up these properties, and then putting them back on the path to home ownership with these families so you know that that family will never have to go back to the illegal. That's what we do. In the Marion County, the final straw, was when I spent $25,000 on a property that we were selling to a young man for $9,000 and the sale got stopped because the carpet was not affixed correctly to the floor. And then I thought, I swear, I saw the guy hold his hand down. That's Marion County. That's when I thought, it's a disgusting, screwed up system that I cannot continue to work with. We had worked with the land bank and even before that with the auditor's office. We have never done an illegal deal. We stand up. I have had a lot of people around me check on me and try and involve me in things. Like I tell my kids, when you're doing what's right, you don't have to be an angel. Just don't be a horse's butt. Stand up and show people what you're doing. You'll always be okay. Hopefully. In the system, though, that bottom 20% of expendable people, they can't even believe in that. Uh, when we take a young man or woman in their teens or 20s and take them out of the system and pay them to make that legal living and get them to the point where they are actually worth it and put them out of the community working, uh, the chances of them going back into the system are cut down to about 20% that they may reoffend instead of the 80-90% it was almost guaranteed of a recidivism. Um, we take that and we show how instead of spending $50,000 a year, they're going to actually pay back to the community. They're going to pay their taxes. They're going to pay sales tax. They're going to pay income tax. They're going to pay property tax because they're going to turn into homeowners. Um, like we all want in this world to feel like we fit. Can you talk about some of your successes? Some, uh, of, the, some, of, the guys and, some of the guys and in Shelbyville in general. Uh, young man right now, Chris, uh, here in town that worked some on our campaign four years ago that bought his own mower and his own pickup truck uh, just a couple years ago and is now a private subcontractor for a landscape crew. He's got his own clients and he's got other clients that the company gives him. Uh, this is a young man that was fourth generation. He would go to jail to see his father. Uh, he, he guaranteed he was going to be a career criminal. Uh, he now is hiring, he hired uh, Donovan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, he hired Jax. He, a well known troublemaker. Another <laughs> troublemaker. I, Taking someone, like I say, that has never had that sense of self-worth, that has always been told they're a worthless piece of shit, and showing them that they actually matter. Uh, but cracking that shell and seeing what you have inside, and then growing that person, 
It's amazing the strength that has came out of that. I've got a family on the path to home ownership that you could do a little bit of research on that was in Time and Newsweek. Oprah Winfrey even went out to Shelby County and interviewed a few of the high school. They were on a path, hopefully, to graduate through an uh, insane gauntlet. He still carries that article in his glove box as a badge of honor, showing that he did it. He's made it. He's not on the anklet, the electronic monitoring anymore. He's not in the system anymore. He doesn't report to anyone anymore. He's taking care of himself. And not only that, but he's teaching his five-year-old and his two-and-a-half-year-old how to go to work. When they were setting their floating floor on their own house, and he had the three-year-old and the five-year-old handing him boards and working together, fixing their home. Um, that's where you break cycles. That's where you change the world. That's where the program actually works. And it's not the dollars, it's the time spent. Yeah, and so when people ask me, what would charity, what would self sustain I mean, Rupert's story, what Rupert talks about, you know, it took one person 20 years ago who said, I'm going to make a difference and I'm just going to put my life towards this effort, and has changed so many lives through, uh, through those efforts, taking a disadvantaged population that is looked down upon and empowering them, and putting them to work, and putting that into properties that are looked down upon and not worth anything, and finding value in things that other people don't see value in, that is what libertarians believe in. Right. That is what we are about. That, that is the private charity system laid out for you, ladies and gentlemen. It yeah. honestly is. That's how we're going to win. People ask, what does a libertarian believe in charity on the charity side? Because so many people believe that the libertarian would say, screw them, let them die on the street. No, we're not like that. But we also know we cannot create entitlement programs that entitle you to sit there and collect one in thirty, forty thousand dollars a year for the rest of your life. You're not going to be that thirty-year-old mother with fifteen children. Oh boy! That is telling a fourteen-year-old, "Hell no, you can't have your own check, but you make a baby, you can have theirs." And it starts the next generation every fifteen years. Yeah, and so. What, what what we have now is not working. Right. And what we have now makes it harder for you to do your work. Exactly. And, you know, we have a system where when we give our dollars on April 15th, we don't follow those dollars. If I invest my dollars in you, then I'm invested in your work and I care more about your program and I'm willing to follow your program more. If I give it to the government, then I feel like I've been stolen from. I show people all the time, especially those that are filing, you know, the long form. We need to be, itemize every darn thing. If you don't, come talk to me. I'll tell you why you should. Even if you're an hourly employee, I don't care. I'll show you how to itemize everything. 10%. Every one of you guys should be giving 10% away to your favorite charity. It comes off your taxes. You're either giving it to the government or giving it to the charity, honestly. Look at that. Stop giving every penny away to the government. Start making them more accountable. Stand up and let's tell them we want to see where our dollars are spent. You know, in an administration that takes half the budget, count how many people are running those 368 agencies. How many people are on that administrative side? And how many millions are on the program side? Yeah, I think if you go back and you listen to episode 144, Amanda's story, you hear um, how useless do good organizations like CPS are, how it is a bureaucracy that has no real teeth and yet has a lot of salary. An insane it. amount of salary. You know, yeah. when you're looking at, uh, uh, I'm sorry, but program after program after program, no program is ran like a business entity should be. You don't have layer after layer after layer of administration. We need to cut a quarter of our administration out and throw it away. Everyone that's collecting those giant salaries, eliminate all their administrative assistance and make them do their job. We've got failing school corporations, but our administrative, our superintendents, that are generating quarter million, half million dollar salaries, but we 
Throw the big flag, say 80, 90% of our seekers graduate, 95% of our seekers graduate. Uh, let's talk about how many of our freshmen graduate. <laughs> Final thoughts, Greg? No, I, there's a lot of ideas to unpack all this because part of it's creating the right incentives through the tax code. Part of it is transitioning away from spending money towards incarceration to rehabilitation and reentry. Right. Part of it is overcoming a pretty big culture that's used to being able to give a dollar at a person standing on a corner on an interstate rather than helping that person find a job. Right. So there's it's a, a lot, lot of there. yeah. There's a lot of work to do. I mean, you're you really are doing. Some people may hate this, either Lord or science work. One of them. <laughs> but um, I mean, you really are. You're one of the champions uh, out there. I tell people all the time, you don't have to be an angel, just don't be an ass. Yeah, you're right. I mean, you're right. And it, but at the same time, what you're doing is hard. It's incredibly hard. It's soul breaking, I'm sure, a lot of the time. Um, it's empowering too. When you see a young man and woman that's helping, empowering their kids. When you see somebody that comes back two or three years later um, in their suits. Showing off their, I uh, just had today, showing off his security badge. He's got security clearance. This kid two years ago was living in my van. <laughs> that, that was a little bit crazy. Uh, it's crazy, honestly. And for everyone out there, if you don't know what charity you should give that 10% to, check out Rupert's. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big part of You can also work in. All right, before we move on to our next segment, uh, we, we gave, we're going to give out a $50 prize to the person that brought the most first-timers. So, right. was there anybody that brought two friends with them? Stand if you're a virgin. Stand. Stand up if you brought two friends. Two friends? And you brought your two friends? All right, well, come, come on up here and come sit next to me. Uh, Harry Price, get the money. <laughs> Harry. Harry. Chop, chop. <laughs> I'm the one. Tell, tell us your name. Sarah Potter, it's nice to meet you. I know you from the internet. Yeah, you do. Yeah, and uh, you're here locally? Yes. Well, thank you. Uh, so can you tell us where you found your friends at? Uh, my <laughs> friends were from middle school. We were at Paul Hadley Middle School in Morrisville. So we were on the spellable team together. You brought middle schoolers to the bar? Uh, <laughs> we're not in middle school anymore. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, this is Harry. Harry, uh, Hi, Harry. presenting the $50 to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> And that is brought to you by Josh Featherstone and the Now Trending Show. So thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I got the We Need to Start Wrapping Up sign. Okay. All right. Um, we didn't get a chance to talk to, to little Brett Bittner. Um, uh, he's he's uh, not to be very bad. Uh, Brett, 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 come on up here. Little Brett. Uh, I want Brett to give us a quick preview of Brett. what we're going to see <laughs> this weekend. We love little Brett. Hammer, so. Hammer of Truth is a news site that did a polling. Yeah, I printed it out. Uh, Hammer of Truth is a news site that did some polling about uh, libertarian membership and how often people vote. This is why everyone that's a delegate has been getting telemarketing calls 24-7. Right. Correct. Actually, no. no. For instance, right. uh, Ron Paul has an 81% favorable rating. Gary Johnson, 80%. This is why liberty people hate libertarians. Um, Austin Peterson at 61%, uh, Zip Star 63, John Mack, Star Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Isn't he the like, Morgan County Chair here? <laughs> 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 Eric, can you help me out? Tell me who Big Star is again. Uh, so, Donald Trump has a 24% approval rating with the National Libertarian Membership. Excellent. Among Libertarians, that's pretty solid. Barack Obama has uh, are 16%, great? Hillary Clinton, 8 Uh So, this, we, we actually have a real race for president. Yes. Yeah, we've got uh, John McAfee, Gary Johnson, Austin Peterson, and I think Daryl Parody will have a strong showing, too. Uh, I see don't, don't, don't laugh, I'm serious. Hey, I see all four of them on the debate stage. Yeah. Uh, and this polling, why don't you go ahead and read, so the polling for the presidential race, who is a favorite amongst those attending, 153. Was there a Brett Bittner approval rating? <laughs> it was actually. <laughs> I don't see it. Actually, it was, he is other at point six. It's not part of the curse. Hang on, hang on. I, I actually do have an approval rating thing here. Before. Read the president. Read for president. You, know, you, know, you want me to go top best to worst? Every, no, no, no. No, every time oh, okay. I get Brett Bittner on this program, he talks about Brett Bittner. I, I didn't I know I will think about me. <laughs> All right, hey, Brad, who is number one in the presidential polling? Well, Gary Johnson, of course, with 60.9%. Boo! Yeah. Oh! Yeah. Sweet, the guy in the Trump hat. Sure, yeah. of course. 
Why, why would you want competition, Ron? <laughs> <laughs> you have Austin Peterson at 16.7, John Maxby at 9.6, Daryl Perry at 8.3. Wow. Uh, and Mark Allen Feldman from Ohio at 1.9%. Now, all of those, this is a survey that was done of Libertarian membership. Um, uh, 1,563 people that were surveyed. Um, they skipped over those that aren't going to be in Orlando, like myself, like Greg. Um, How dare they? I know. Racists. Right. Uh, so, uh, so uh, it's 150. Little no, right here. Well, my, mine is later, <laughs> where they're talking about the new national logo, which had 87% approval. By the Did way. it really? Yes. Did they pull hashtag never bitter? <laughs> not, not yet, but I imagine that region three is going to have quite the, quite the fun. So, so who is your just new maker? Who is your just new maker? <laughs> 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 well, but how, in your educated guess, you travel the state uh, campaigning for your race for Region Three rep, and sure. you know we at We Are Libertarians strongly encourage all delegates to vote for Little Brett Bittner. Yes, please do. Um, who, who, how do you think the presidential race is going to shake out this weekend in Orlando? You know, in all honesty, I think that. Based on when this was done, it was done before the Weld Running Mate announcement or concurrent with that. Um, I think it hurts Gary, in all honesty. Mm -hmm. um, William Weld is a former governor of Massachusetts, former Republican, socially liberal, fiscally conservative, a, a governor of the 90s, and yet has some, uh, some various statements. If you go to wearelibertarians.com, go scroll down on the sidebar of the group. We've posted some articles about William Weld in the group. Check it out, or look up your libertarian friends. They all hate the guy. He hasn't been relevant in so long. Like I was shocked there was a backlash about I've, this. I've never heard. He looks like Howdy Doody grew up. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you think that uh, Gary has problems this weekend? Honestly, I do. Um, taking a look at how things are going to lay are going to play out, I, I would say that Gary is probably not going to win it on the first ballot. Whoa. If, if I had, if I had to say. Right now, based on what I'm seeing and the sentiment that I'm seeing, especially with regard to his running mate choice, I think it really hurts him to tell the delegates, hey, I don't trust you to make the right choice for VP. And by the way, here's this guy that screwed, that is endorsing a guy who screwed you two years ago with John Kasich, um, who, but why, why, why do you say that about him choosing his running mate? He did that with Judge Gray four years ago. Right, well, he saw a huge drop-off from the 70-plus percent that Gary got yeah. to the mid-50s that Judge Gray got. Sure. And Judge Gray was a known quantity to the LP at the time. Sure. Well, does not. No. So do you this think they punish, they punish Gary and Gary gets the nod, but then they don't give him William Well? I, I think it would be very hard for the delegation to give, or the delegations to give Gary Well as the VP. Who are the other choices? Well, not only do you have the people who don't win the presidential race, which we see every time people Mac win. McAfee's out, though. Well, McAfee says that he's out if he's not the nominee. Um, I imagine that Austin Peterson will drop down to VP. I imagine that Daryl Perry will do so. I imagine that Mark Feldman will do so. And then there are about a dozen others that are essentially also rams for the presidential nomination. And I see them dropping down to VP as well. Do you think it's possible that we get a Johnson Peterson ticket? I think it's possible, but you also have some very strong <laughs> VP candidates. You have Alicia Dern, yeah. you have Larry Sharp, you have Will Coley. But let's, no offense to those folks. Right. Nobody's heard of those folks. They right. have not campaigned. They they're very campaigned. nice, but they're low energy. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't go with that because I actually know several of these people personally. And I had the opportunity to get to know Will Coley last weekend when I was in Lansing for the Libertarian Party of Michigan uh, convention. And I would have to say that there is, you, you guys may discount the idea that somebody who's running for VP that you've never heard of but they have a strong following within the party. Alicia Dern does from four years ago in working as an attorney for our America Initiative. Um, Larry Sharp, who's relatively new to the spotlight, um, actually has a really good shot just because of his ability to communicate ideas. And once people get to know who the heck he is, it's going to be something, he's going to be a force to be reckoned with. Um, I had the fortune of meeting him when I was in DC in September of 2014, uh, the very first LNC meeting that we had with the current uh, the current LNC, 
And I was blown away by the guy. He wasn't running for VP at the time. He was just a concerned New York libertarian. But at the end of the day, uh, running mate is a part of your your strategy for your campaign. Yep. If I were a delegate, I would vote for Weld because that's part of what Johnson wants. Because I, if, I, if Johnson is the nominee, right. yeah. if Johnson is the nominee at that point, I would vote for William Weld because you know it's part it, it, it's vice president for the Libertarian Party. Sure. Right. Mm -hmm. I weld while feeling the Johnson. Well, and, but here's the thing. All right, we gotta we gotta uh, wrap up here. They're getting itchy. I didn't know we had to hit a hard eight thirty. Uh -oh. So gotcha. thank you, Brett Bittner, win your race, along with a couple other Hoosiers, Sam Goldstein's running for vice chair, Mark Rutherford for chair. And uh, Nick Starwalk looks like he's winning handily in, the, in that race, though. So all uh, shout out to Mark. So thank you very much sure. to Brett Thank Hitler. you, Mr. Brett Whitner. You know, I know this year I've got people that have never even considered the Libertarian Party looking at Libertarian Party candidates. Uh, yeah. I mean, I keep looking at that darn hat. It's amazing what that's doing for the Libertarian Party. Isn't it amazing? Yes. All right, well, thank you, Rupert, for joining us. No, thanks for having me. Thank give, you. Us, give us your closing thoughts. Um, you know, stand up. Don't ever believe that you can't change the world. It's amazing what you can do. We can all stand together. We're never all going to agree, but we do agree that the path we're on is not the right path. RupertSkins.org, hit that donate button. Let's change the world. We're out of time, so I'm not going to troll you, but <laughs> man, do I want to. You're going to be in Orlando, right? I will. I will. I've always wanted to see Disney World, I'm going to take this time to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Woo All right. Uh, Greg, your final thoughts? No, uh, you know, something we talked about is the uh, multiculturalism and like the browning of Europe by such a free and open immigration laws. I don't know if you saw, but in Austria, the hard right, the modern equivalent of the Nazi party is in a runoff with another right-wing party in Austria right now. So it's kind of a, at a tipping point where you can see spread like wildfire people that are going to make Donald Trump look like child's play. Let me just say that uh, <laughs> Rupert's mom is a wonderful lady. Rupert's mom obviously produced a wonderful man. Rupert's mom is a Syrian immigrant. She is 100% Syrian. Yep. Uh, her brother and sister were born in Syria. She was born uh, like within months of arriving in the United States, I'm that first generation where all of us in our generation are American. American. Uh, you know, every one of us. There's very few, very, very few people that can say they came from America. Uh, but the name America is about it. Maybe some Vikings that are out there, or, you know, that have been around since, but that's about it. Ooh, we're we're maybe okay from somewhere. Uh, we're a bunch of months. All right, thank you all for joining us. Thank you guys for coming out. Yes. Special shout out to my brother and sister and brother-in-law. They actually, my, for the first time ever, my family came out and supported something I did. Worst decision ever. <laughs> the truth is they came out for Emily. They didn't come out for me and then Emily couldn't make it tonight. So. Great you lied to I didn't lie to them. Uh, Thank you all for joining us. You guys have been awesome. It's so great to see so many uh, new faces. I hope you guys had a good time. I hope that you guys will come out again and bring some friends next time. Uh, we want to keep this growing. We're going to do this every month. It's a great outreach opportunity. Bring your friends. Obviously, there's wheat in the crowd. Uh, so. <laughs> he didn't share either, so you know he's a libertarian. Oh, uh, one final. This is for Mr. Tyler Weiss. Weiss. This is Donald Trump's water. So you know we went to the Trump rally uh, a little bit ago, and I was the last, second to last member of the media in the pit, and I went up on stage and stole Mr. Trump's water, and this is for my good friend Tyler. Uh, he said that Donald Trump could never win the nomination, and I told him he was an idiot. <laughs> All right, thank you for joining us here on We Are Libertarians, and as always, we promise to do better next time. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. We are Libertarians, everybody. Keep it going for them. He did a spell to overstay his welcome. He was supposed to be done five minutes ago. Uh, be sure to visit rupertskids.org.
I want to build a house now after watching him, right? No? Just me? All right, I'll build a house for myself. Uh, we are Libertarians. They do this uh, once a month, so be sure to come back next month. It's spinning. The crowd is spinning. We need more supporters. But uh, we are Libertarians. Be sure to check out the posters. They're $10 back there. If you throw in 15, Spangle will sign it, Greg will sign it. And yeah. I was expecting applause after the signing thing. So, uh, I understand, I'm not that excited. But uh, jimbibber.com, check that out. There's a great podcast on there. It's in the top 100, unlike this podcast. This garbage podcast you just watch. So, uh, yeah, check out those posters. Also, they're about to do live karaoke. Live karaoke people are coming in, and this is way better than the podcast you just watched.